How is it possible, ladies and gentlemen, that we could read Acts chapter 10? You don't need to know Hebrew. You don't need to know Aramaic. You don't need to know Greek. You hardly need to know English. All we have to do is read the context of Acts chapter 10 and actually read past verse 16 and 17, past verse 10 and and, and following, and read to verse 28 where Yahweh makes it very clear. Peter even understands. Even goes so far that he furthers, when he goes back to Jerusalem, he tells James, the president, Yaakov, the president of the council of Jerusalem, and he explains it to them. He says, man, I thought that it was about food, but I was wrong. We must go to the Gentiles. The gospel must go to the Gentiles. The good news of Yeshua coming and dying for the sins of all mankind must Go to the nations. Why? Because Yahweh showed me that He has made them clean through the blood of the Lamb. And how dare us call them unclean. You see, my friends, when we go into the Scriptures with a a bias, a denominational creed, with our filter, looking through the glasses of what, how we grew up and the belief system that we have, we will pull from the Scriptures what's not there. And that is a scary situation when you start rewriting Scripture. Because if we're not careful and we don't take doctrine seriously and we don't look at the Bible from the original Hebraic perspective that Yahweh wrote it in through these Hebrew authors, we could we could very well walk away from the Scriptures teaching people the very opposite of what God intended. And I don't know about you, but I do not want to answer before my king on Judgment Day that I taught anybody anything that was not his word. So let's continue. Let's move to another Scripture. How about Romans chapter 14? Turn with me in your Bibles. And by the way, I am using a, 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 a Bible called the Scriptures. So if you're, if you're curious of the Bible version that I'm using, it's called the Scriptures. Uh, or the Hallelujah Bible is another one. You can find them on our website at passionfortruth.com. But turn with me in Romans chapter 14. And this becomes a very interesting Scripture. Uh, again, a Scripture that I personally use to say we can eat whatever we want. But as we go through here, you're going to see that there's another angle, another perspective, the Hebraic perspective. Romans chapter 14, read with me. And receive him who was weak in the faith, weak in the belief, not criticizing his thoughts. One indeed believers, one indeed believes to eat all food, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. He that eats Let him not despise him who does not eat. And he that does not eat, let him not judge him who eats. For Elohim received him. Who are you that judges another servant? To whom his own master he stands or falls? But, excuse me, but he shall be made to stand. For Elohim is able to make him stand. One indeed judges one day above another. Another judges every day alike. Let each one be completely persuaded in his own mind. Let's stop there for one moment. So here's what we've got. We have a context where Paul says in Romans to the church in Rome, he says, listen, uh, there's a weak in the faith. So we have to define what does weak in the faith mean? What does weak in a belief system is what the word there mean? And also he says, uh, one indeed believes that you can eat all, although the word food is in italics there, which means it's not in the original language. So one indeed believes to eat all, so there's something understood there, but one who is weak eats only vegetables. Now this can't be, ladies and gentlemen, because we go back to Daniel and we find a story where Daniel is eating only vegetables and he proves that he's stronger than all of the other men that are eating meat. So it can't be a physical thing that he's talking about. And I'm going to suggest to you that it's not at all talking about the physicality of being weak or strong. It's talking about weak in mind, the belief system, the reasoning why this person is only eating vegetables is a weak reason. It's weak in his belief system. We're going to talk about this. We're going to unpack this and show you that there's actually another chapter of the Bible that describes what's happening here. 
and we have to go back and forth in order to d discuss this. Now, if you come to chapter 5, or verse 5, here's what we find. It says, let each one be completely persuaded in his own mind. Now, this is what many people will say. Jim, I am convinced that I can eat a cow. I'm convinced that I can eat a pig. So don't judge me and I won't judge you. Now let me ask you a question. If truth is true, we should be able to extrapolate that philosophy out to every single thing that you can think of and it should still work. Let me give you an example. If we should be fully persuaded in our own mind, and that's exactly what the scripture is saying, is that all we have to do is be persuaded in our own mind, then why is it that some people, why do we criticize some people for saying that they're persuaded in their own mind that homosexuality is okay? They're persuaded in their mind that doing drugs is okay. They're persuaded in their own mind that, uh, that doing this is okay, that doing that's okay. If we use that philosophy, my friends, that we cannot criticize anyone for anything because everyone is persuaded in their own mind. Is there any of you in this room that are not persuaded in your own mind of why you do what you do? People that commit abortions are persuaded in their own mind that it's okay to kill life, to kill the unborn. Clearly, the apostle is not creating a new precedent, erasing the entire scriptures and the word of God and saying, hey, just be whatever you want to do. Just be persuaded in your own mind. He's not saying that. There's something else going on. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and we will find out exactly what's happening here. We'll get a clue. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we have a very similar situation happening here. We're using the same terminology. So by discussing or going through some of the context of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we will be able to discover exactly what Romans 14 means. Please read with me. And concerning food offered to idols... We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds. If anyone thinks that he knows something, what he does not yet know, if anyone thinks that he knows something, he does not yet know as he should know. But if anyone loves Yahweh, this one is known by him. So then, concerning the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing. It's no matter at all in the world. And that there is no other Elohim but one. There's only one God, the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6. For even if there is so-called mighty ones, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many mighty ones and many masters, for us there's only one Elohim, the Father, from whom all came and from whom we live, and one Master, Yeshua the Messiah, through whom all came and through whom we live. However, listen to this, we don't all have this knowledge. In other words, not everyone is mature enough to understand that there's only one God, one Messiah, and nobody else matters, nothing else matters. So he says, but some, in verse 7, being aware of the idol, until now, eat it, eat it as having been offered to an idol, so their conscience, being weak, is defiled. So what's he saying? He's saying that if someone, as, well, let's just back up. You have to understand some of the context in a first century market is that there's, there's meat that's being hung in the market, it's being sold at market, and it's not being uh, disclosed whether or not it's being offered to an idol or not. So when they buy this meat, many times they're not 100% sure whether it's been offered to an idol. And so a new believer is eating meat that's uh, offered to an idol, and he is offended by that. And Paul says that's a weak conscience, because what Paul's perspective is, which by default would be called a strong conscience or strong in the faith, is that a strong believer believes that there's only one God. So the idol is nothing. When an animal that God says is clean, like an, a lamb or a goat, gets, gets sacrificed to an idol, Paul says, I don't have any problem in eating that because I'm not, taking part, I'm not partaking in that, that ritual, and it doesn't make the animal unclean. And so Paul says that if you have a problem eating meat offered to an idol, 
I respect where you're coming from, but, but that is a weak conscience. They don't fully understand that that idol means nothing. Are you, is this making sense? I encourage you to go back and study this on your own. You'll, you'll see this. It takes a little bit uh, to comb through this and really see what's going on, but that's what's happening. Let's continue. Let's see what verse were we on here. It says, uh, here we go, verse 9. But, but look to it, lest somehow this right of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge that there's only one God and that idols mean nothing, eating in an idol's place, meaning eating, idol, eating uh, meat offered to idols, shall not his conscience, if he is weak, be built up to eat food offered to idols? So this weak brother for whom Messiah died shall perish through your knowledge. Now sinning in this way against the brothers and wounding their weak conscience, you sin against the Messiah. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I am never going to eat meat again, lest my brother stumble. Do you you see what the last verse says? It says, I will never eat meat again. So this is about whether we should eat meat or eat only vegetables. So he's defining those that do not want to eat meat because they're not sure if it's been offered to idols. What else are they going to eat? They're going to eat vegetables. And he calls those people weak. He's not doing it as an insult. He's just saying that these are new believers that don't fully understand that idols mean nothing. If Yahweh made a lamb, he made it clean. It's always clean. Regardless of what happens to that lamb, it's still clean. Now, there are some parameters in the Torah, uh, and, I, and I, I don't want to go there, but for the sake of conversation and, and, and t- context, sticking with 1 Corinthians 8 and Romans 14, this is what it's talking about. So now that we know that Paul in 1 Corinthians defines a weak conscience as someone who cannot eat meat because he's not sure if it's offered to idols or not, now let's go back to Romans 14, and this is all going to make sense. Okay, so now let's read Romans 14 again, and it, and it should completely become clear. And receive whom his, him who is weak in the faith, not criticizing his thoughts. So a brand new believer that, that thinks that it's wrong to eat meat that is offered to idols. One indeed believes to eat all food, all meat. But he who is weak only eats vegetables. Verse 3, he that eats, let him not despise him who does not eat meat. And he that does not eat Let him not judge him who eats, for Elohim receives him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. But he shall be made to stand, for for God is able to make him stand. One indeed judges... Now, 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 stopping in verse 5, we understand exactly what's happening. Is everybody on the same page? We understand that he's saying, don't judge one another. You think eating meat's okay. You think eating, not eating meat is okay. Then he seems to switch to another subject. So let's continue in verse 5. One indeed judges one day above another, and another judges every day alike. Let each one be completely persuaded in his own mind. He who minds the day minds it to Yahweh, And he who does not mind the day to Yahweh, he does not mind it. He who eats, eats to God, for he gives Elohim thanks. He who does not eat to Yahweh, he does not eat and give Elohim thanks. For not one of us lives to himself, and not one dies to himself. For both, if we live, we live unto unto the Master, and if we die, we die unto the Master, Christ. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are Messiahs. So here... We have, we're all talking about whether we should eat meat or eat vegetables, and really Paul is trying to get everybody to get along, is what's going on. He's trying everybody to get along, they don't get off on these rabbit trails. How many times we get, we start majoring on the minors, and we minor on the majors? And Paul is saying, this has nothing to do with Torah. This has nothing to do with the Torah. This has nothing to do with what God has has told you to do or not to do. So he is making what is called a halakhic decision. He's making a judgment as the chief apostle of the church in Rome and in Corinth, and he's interpreting the Torah and explaining to them how to live their life. So he starts out in the verse, verse 4 verses of Romans 14 talking about food, and then all of a sudden it seems that he starts talking about a day. And when I say a day, what are you thinking of? 
Sabbath. That's right. You're thinking of the Sabbath, that setting a Sabbath day. Now, let me ask you a question. Does it make any sense to you at all that Paul all of a sudden starts talking about eating meat and not eating meat and being nice to each other for, for what you believe that you should eat as far as meat sacrificed to idols or not, and all of a sudden he just switches it and starts talking about the Sabbath? That makes no sense. It's not even logical. I'm going to submit to you that if we read very carefully, you're going to see that he's never stopped talking about food. Let's read verse 5 again. One indeed judges one day above another. Another judges every day alike. Let each one be completely persuaded in his own mind. Now, if we're still talking about food, think of what we could be talking about. It's going to give it away in verse 6. He who minds the day minds it to Yahweh. He who does not mind the day or keep the day eats to Yahweh. For he who Elohim, for he gives Elohim thanks. And he who does not eat on that day to Yahweh, he does not eat and gives Elohim thanks. So what is going on here? What are we talking about? He starts talking about eating and not eating and a day. What is that called when you're not eating on a day? Fasting. That's right. We're talking about fasting. In the first century, uh, many of the Jews, the sects, uh, there are 26 sects of Judaism, many of them fasted at least once, most of them twice a week. Some of them thought it was Monday and Thursday. Some of them thought it was Tuesday and Friday, uh, and so on and so forth. And so there was always a debate, always a debate about who's right and who's wrong, even though nowhere in the Torah does it say which day that you have, uh, have to fast. But traditions, just like today, ladies and gentlemen, you start messing with tradition, you start stepping on people's emotional toes. And that can be a dangerous thing to do. If you've watched Truth or Tradition, you know exactly what I'm talking about. DVD that we, that we, that we put out several years ago causes a great stir. But it's either true or it's tradition. This is the same problem that Paul is having that Yeshua, Jesus, had himself in the first century dichotomizing between the two. What's true and what is tradition? And so what's happening is, is that Paul is saying that, listen, some of you think that you need to fast on this day. Some of you think you need to fast on this day. And, and I don't care when you fast. I don't care if you eat or you don't eat. If you eat meat or only eat vegetables, Listen, all of you are accountable to him. He's our master. You're just a servant. Leave each other alone. Respect one another when you're dealing with things that are not specifically lined out in the Scriptures. So the practical application of this is this. As you come into the knowledge of the Scriptures and your Hebrew roots, and you start reading the front of the book, and you start learning about some of these commandments, re recognize that you're still weak. You've never done this before. You may be the first time that you've ever read through the Torah in your life from this new perspective, and Yahweh may illuminate a law to you, and you may be, because you're new, may interpret it a little bit different way. Give grace to your neighbor who's reading it a different way, because we are all serving the same Elohim, the same God, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We all are accountable to Him first and then to one another. So if we would just open up our hearts to one another and love one another, we actually would probably figure this front of the book out a lot faster than we are. All right, so is this making sense? Romans 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, it's all about eating meat offered to idols and whether we should just not eat meat altogether. I understand. Uh, there are people today that if they can't find organic meat, they will not eat meat altogether. I, I don't blame them with all of the, the, uh, the uh, uh, chemicals that they're putting into our animals today that science are, is now catching up saying that m a lot of the disease that we have is directly related to the food and the meat that we eat. Many people have given up eating meat altogether. It's the same kind and type of thought process that happened in the first century. Okay, All right, let's move along. We're almost finished here. Let's move to 1 Timothy chapter 4. This is one of my favorite scriptures on this subject. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Say, Jim, right here, man, 1 Timothy 4 says that, that all we got to do is pray over our food and we can eat whatever we want. 
But let's read 1 Timothy chapter 4 and see if that's exactly what the author is saying. Read with me in your Bibles. It says, But the Spirit distinctly says that in latter times some shall fall away from the belief, fall away from the faith, okay? Paying attention to misleading spirits and teachings of demons. If I had a dollar for every person that said, because of the message that I'm bringing with you today, that I am a, a, a bringing a, a doctrine of demons, we could fund our ministry. Because you know what the truth is? This message is going to affect one thing, this right here, your flesh. Your flesh is going to fight this message. You know why? Because you want to do what you want to do. Your flesh wants the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's tasted it before, and it tastes good. Even in the garden, my friends, there was clean and unclean. Yahweh looked at the tree of life and said, it is clean. And he says, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do not eat. It is unclean. When you eat of it, you will become, as serpent says, like me. You will know good from evil. And you don't even know what that means. So just trust me. Don't eat it. Today, Yahweh says the same thing. Do not eat the animals that I created to be the vacuum cleaners of the earth. I'm not going to tell you why because you don't need to know why because you're my son, you're my daughter. I call you children, not teenagers. I'm not calling you adults. I'm calling you children for a reason. I want you to trust me that when you eat unclean animals, it's no different than the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You don't know what evil is because you've never tasted of it before, but the moment that you taste of unclean animals, it will do damage to your body. You don't need, I don't need to tell you why. Just trust me. I'm smarter than you, <laughs> as a friend of mine says. So let's continue. He says in verse 2, Speaking lies and hypocrisy, these people are, having been branded on their own conscience, forbidding to marry, saying to abstain from foods which Elohim created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Now let's stop here and read this verse again in verse 3. Read it carefully. These people who he wants them to ignore are speaking lies and hypocrisy. Having excuse me, saying to abstain from food, which we've already decided and, 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 and come to a conclusion what the definition of food is from his perspective, which Elohim, which God created to be received with thanksgiving. So let me ask you a question. You're a first century Jew. You're a Hebrew. You don't even know what the New Testament is because it hasn't been written. It hasn't been canonized. It doesn't even exist. So the only scriptures that are there, when Timothy says all scripture is God-breathed and worthy for correction and reproof and way of righteousness, the only scripture that exists at that time is what we call the Old Testament. So from their perspective, where is it that God gives the instructions on the definition of food that he declares is clean? As we already went through, Leviticus chapter 11. So in Leviticus 11 is where Elohim says it is good. Leviticus 11 is where God says, I want to give you these things and I want you to receive them with thanksgiving. By those who believe and know the truth. So God created to be received, in verse 4, verse 3, with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Because if you know the truth, the truth can only do what? Set you free. Verse 4, because every creature of Elohim is good, and none of it's to be rejected. Is there a period there? This is really critical. How many know that in Semitic languages there is no punctuation, no commas, no periods? We better know exactly what the context is. And I'm going to tell you, my friends, for some reasons, our theologians, professors, and so on and so forth, and pastors and pulpits all across the world stop right here on this verse before they even finish the rest of the verse. And it says, that this Jim, God created everything. He said it's good and none of it's to be rejected. And they only quote half the verse. Let's read the other half of the verse, which is going to tell us exactly what God is saying, what he really is meaning through this scripture. None of it is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is set apart by the word of God and prayer. Folks, think about what he's saying. 
This is a Jew that's writing this. A Jewish apostle in the first century. What is the definition of the Word of God? He already said that Yahweh gave us these, the definition of food. He gave it and created it and told us and sanctified it. Folks, food is not food unless it is sanctified, unless it is set apart by the Torah, by the Word of God. We know there's only one place in all the Bible that tells us what the definition of food is. As we've said a hundred times, it's Leviticus chapter 11. So it must be sanctified by Leviticus chapter 11 or it cannot be eaten. So what's happening over and over through all of these scriptures from Mark chapter 7 and all the ones we've gone through thus far, the majority of the context is the the religious leaders of the day are going beyond the written text and they're creating their own Torah, which in Hebrew means instructions. They're creating their own instructions. They're saying that we know that the Torah says this, we know that God says this, but if you do this, say this, don't wash your hands, uh, have a meat offered to idols, so on and so forth, it's going to make it unclean. So there's a debate on what is clean and what is unclean. Paul is saying, listen, you guys are making this way too complicated. Just go to what's sanctified by the Word of God. Go to Leviticus chapter 11, and you'll see exactly what God says is clean or unclean hogwash, no pun intended, with the rest of what everyone's saying. So let's read it now all together. Verse 4, Because every creature of Elohim is good, and none of it is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving, for it is set apart by the word of God and prayer. If you present these matters to the brothers, you shall be good servant of Yahweh, being nourished in the words of belief and of good teaching which you followed closely. So on and so forth. The point of this scripture is that not that you can just pray over, you know, a poisonous tree frog right before you eat it, and magically it's going to be non-toxic, and you can eat it and be fine. As long as you thank the Lord for this poisonous tree frog, and thank you, Father, for this rattlesnake, and I just pray that before I eat it raw, that uh, it won't kill me. Of course not. You can't eat poisonous tree frogs. You can't eat snakes and so on and so forth. Why? Because they will hurt you. They're unclean. They're not sanctified by the Word of God. Am I I making this clear? I want everyone to make sure that you understand what the author is saying here. We can't just use the Scriptures for our own benefit because we want to eat that barbecued pork chop. Now, I'll tell you, I grew up with barbecued pork chop, and there's almost nothing better. But now I can't even smell a pork chop without wanting to gag because my body's been cleansed of even the the smell of an unclean animal makes me sick. Your body's not created to eat it. We've trained our bodies to eat things that are unclean. And then we wonder why we get the diseases of the Gentiles, like the prophets say. Eat what the Gentiles eat, get the diseases of the Gentiles. Why do we have so much disease? Most likely because of the food that we eat. Put toxins in the body, probably going to have toxic things happen. Garbage in, garbage out, as they say in the computer realm. What is food? Over and over again, we talk about Leviticus chapter 11. So let me quote it for you again, just these two verses, so that it becomes very clear in your mind what the definition of food is. This is the law of the beast, verse 46, and the fowl, and of every living creature that moveth in the waters, and of every creature that creepeth upon the earth, to make a difference between the unclean and the clean, between the beast that may be eaten, and the beast they may not be eaten. Now let's turn to one of the last scriptures we're going to talk about, one of my favorites, Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Now I shouldn't say that it's one of my favorites, because This is one of the favorite scriptures that people will bring up uh, when I mention the Sabbath or the Shabbat or when I mention uh, eating clean or unclean. This is typically uh, one of the top verses where people go is Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, 17. So read it with me. Let no one therefore judge you in eating or drinking or in respect of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, which are shadows of what is to come, but the body is of Mashiach, or Messiah, okay, body is of Christ. 
So let's start in reverse here and talk about this, this verse because this verse is interesting because I've got a, it talks about a shadow. These are shadows of things to come, but the body is of Christ. I've got a picture on the screen of a guy with a shadow. Now let me ask you a question. If Yeshua, if Jesus the Christ is standing out in the sun and you are in his shadow, could you by default be saying that you are close to him? Makes sense, right? If you're not in the shadow, clearly you're not close to him. And I'm talking in the physical. If you're in anyone's shadow, that means that you are in the perimeter close to their body. So can we make a deduction that being in the shadow of the Messiah is a good thing? Okay, good. So we're in the shadow is being a good thing. So if you back up and look at verse 16 and 17 again, it says, it says that the, the respect of the festivals, the feast days, he's talking about the feast days of the Bible. If you're not familiar with the feast days of the Bible, I encourage you to, uh, to research them. I get God's prophetic calendar where I go over all of the feast days of the Bible. There's seven. God has a calendar. How many know he doesn't go by our calendar? He goes by his. Most of us don't even know what his calendar is. Did you know that Yeshua died on Passover, was put in the grave during the Feast of Unleavened Bread where they were getting all of the sin out of their house. He rose from the grave during the uh, festival of first fruits, which is why he's called the first fruits. And he and the Holy Spirit comes down on, in Acts chapter 2, on Pentecost. In Hebrew, that's called Shavuot. In Greek, it's called Pentecost. These are four, the first four feast days of the year, called the spring feast days. All deal with the first coming of the Messiah. The second coming of the Messiah happens during the fall feast days. Yeshua can't come anytime he wants. He comes according to what his own calendar says. It's prophesied, you see. And so he says that these feast days and the Sabbaths and the new moons, they're all shadows of things to come. Notice another thing. It doesn't, see, it doesn't say shadows of things that came. Because remember, this is after Yeshua already came. He says of things to come, which means they haven't happened yet. These are shadows of the Messiah. So if we've already agreed that being in the shadow of the Messiah is a good thing, by logical deduction, if the feast days and the Shabbat, the Sabbath, is a shadow by the definition of the apostle here, then being in the feast days and taking part of the Shabbat is a good thing. That means that you are close to the Messiah. He is the one casting the shadow. Somehow in Christianity, in, in some religious circles, we have literally said that the shadow is done away with. Can I propose a thought for you? What happens if we do away with the shadow? What are we doing away with really? That's right. We're doing away with the Messiah. Because you cannot have a shadow unless you have someone casting it. So if you remove the shadow, you remove the Messiah himself. We better be very, very, very careful about what we remove and what we replace. Because my Bible tells me, don't add to or take away from my word or you'll be cursed. I don't want to be on judgment day accused of taking anything away. I just want to understand exactly what we should do. And by the way, on that note, if judgment day comes, when judgment day comes, if the way that we are reading these scriptures are true, and someone decides not to eat unclean animals, do they get in trouble on judgment day? Do they get in trouble and God say, I cannot believe that you did not eat pork after I died to set a pig free? <laughs> of course not. But on the other hand, if the way that we're reading this is true, and the disciple was not talking and not taking away from the Torah. And we stand before God. We're going to have to explain why we are breaking His laws in this area. You see, it's a win-win if you choose not to eat it. It could be not a win-win situation if you choose to.
So we need to understand these things. Okay, back to Colossians chapter 2. Now, in order to truly understand what he's talking about, because it seems to say here, and what people will say is, Jim, uh, don't judge me on what Sabbath day I choose or, or what I choose to eat. Don't judge me. You're not allowed to. It says right here in Colossians chapter 2. You're the heretic for saying that we do these things and focusing on the shadow. No, I'm not focusing on the shadow. It says that these are shadows of things to come, and being in the shadow is a good thing. But we need to decide exactly what the author's saying. In order to do that, we need to know the context. So please turn to verse 1 of chapter 2, and let's read. And it's going to be amazing how we take things out of context and how clear this can really be. Here we go. For I wish to know, you to know what a great struggle I have for you in, the, in, in those late... Uh, lady, the see him. For, uh, for as many have not seen my face in the flesh, in order that their hearts might be encouraged, be knit together in love. And to all the riches of the entire confirmation of understanding, to a true knowledge of the secret of God and the Father and of the Messiah, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say so that no one deceives you with enticing words. So now he's going to start describing and defining who these people are that are going to be deceiving them. First of all, they're going to deceive with enticing words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfast of your belief in Messiah. Therefore, as you accepted Messiah Jesus, Yeshua the Master, walk in Him, having been rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as you were taught, overflowing in it with thanksgiving. Listen very careful because this is the key verse right here in verse 8. See to it that no one makes a prey of you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary matters of the world, and not according to the Messiah. What are we talking about? Once again, do anybody see a theme, a thematic expression going through all of these scriptures that we're talking about? What constantly keeps being brought up? The tradition and doctrine of men. Let me ask a question for those of you that that believe it, that we can eat whatever we want. And I understand where you're coming from. I've been there, done that. But would you say that any commandment that God gave in the Old Testament was a tradition or a doctrine of man. The very definition of, of man means that it originated, it progenated from within a man, not from the creator of the universe. If Yahweh gives a commandment, take the Ten Commandments for example, if God gives a commandment, it did not come from man, it came from God. And so Paul is warning in uh, the book of Colossians in chapter 2, He's warning of these people that are going to prey on you through wonderful words, philosophy, vain deceit, and the tradition and doctrines of men. In other words, they are going to come at you and they're not going to bring the word of God. They're not going to quote the Torah. They're not going to quote the prophets or the Psalms. They're going to quote themselves and their oral law and their traditions and they're going to impute their motives and agendas on you. And if you don't know the word of God, you will be taken advantage of. They will deceive you. How did Eve get deceived in the garden? She didn't believe the word of God. She believed something else. The enemy came along and deceived her, twisted what Yahweh had said, made her doubt that God didn't really mean what he said. So we see now when we get to uh, Colossians chapter uh, 2, verse 16, let's start in verse 14. It says, having blotted out that which is written by hand against you, by the dogmas which stood against us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. I can't tell you how many people said, Jim, right here it says, he took the Torah and nailed it to the cross. Folks, are you kidding me? Are you think that really the apostle of all apostles, the one who sat under Gamaliel, and the only requirement to sit under Gamaliel, was to have the entire Torah memorized word for word. The guy that in Romans chapter 3, verse 31 says that just because faith came, does that mean that the, that the law of God is made void? May it never be. I uphold the Torah. Do you really think that he is saying that God is nailing his own word to the cross and getting rid of it? 
I thought that Yeshua, Jesus, was the Word of God. I thought He was the one being nailed to the cross. Not that He's, he's nailing the Word of God to the cross. But He's nailing, what? The curse of the law. That's what Yeshua became. He said Yeshua became the curse of the law. He's nailing our trespasses. It's helpful to know that in oral law, in the first century Judaism, that the laws against the Torah, he's nailing all of those laws to the cross. All of the traditions and the doctrines of men. Doesn't that make much more sense in context that he already defines, verse 8, that what they're saying is the tradition and doctrine of men. They're criticizing you and telling you that you're in sin for breaking their own laws. And Yeshua comes and not only dies for your sin against the Torah, but he's destroying the traditions and doctrines of men. This is why in verse 15 it says, having stripped the principalities and the authorities. What authorities? The authorities not only on in the heavenly realms, the demonic authorities, but he's stripping the earthly authorities. He removes the high priesthood from man and gives it to the rightful high priest, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. He's stripping them of all their, their laws. If you take their constitution away, you're literally taking away their power to judge you or condemn you on something that is false. So having stripped the principalities and the authorities, having made a public display of them, having prevailed over them in it, let no one therefore judge you in eating or drinking, or in respect of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, which are shadows of what is to come, but the body is of Messiah. Now this is going to give away who this group is if we keep reading. Let no one deprive you of the prize. One who takes delight in false humility and the worship of angels, messengers, taking his stand on what he does not see, puffed up by his own fleshly mind, and holding fast to the head from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the growth of Elohim. If then you died with Christ from the elementary matters of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourself to dogmas? What dogmas? Verse 8, the tradition and doctrine of men. When they say, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which are all things that are going to perish with the use according to the commands and the teachings of men. These indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed worship, humiliation, and harsh treatment of the body, of no value at all, only for the satisfaction of the flesh. If you know anything about first century Gnosticism, it's describing Jewish Gnostics. Gnostics comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. This is a sect that believes uh, in self-mutilation of the body because they believe that the flesh is bad. Every part of the flesh is bad. Meaning that they would cut themselves. They would stand out in the middle of a rainstorm, cut themselves, and, and believe that that is good. They're literally physically killing the flesh so that they can be more holy. They would worship the angels. They, they were prideful and arrogant, puffed up because they believed they knew everything about the Word. Are you puffed up? Are you so glorified in yourself and worshiping yourself, not even realizing you're worshiping yourself because you think you know everything? We've already read scriptures that basically say that the beginning of knowledge is knowing you know nothing. If you think you know anything, you know nothing. And you're not even known by Him. Folks, we are all in kindergarten trying to learn how to follow Yahweh's Word. It's been 2,000 years since us Gentiles read the front of the book, since we put anything valuable in the front of the book. Most of us read it only as fairy tales and, and Sunday school lessons to our children, giving them little pages to color of Noah and the ark. Not even really believing that there's any relevance behind even studying it, how it relates to the back of the book. How can you build a house without a foundation? We spend all our time beautifying our house in the front and the back of the book, learning and understanding the New Testament. And our house, ladies and gentlemen, is not built on the front of the book. Now you say, wait a minute, I thought our house is built on Yeshua. Yeshua is the front of the book. He's every part of the book. He's the rock. He's the foundation. 
The shifting sands that is talked about in the parable of don't build your house on the sands. What is the sands talking about? The tradition and doctrine of men that changes through time, like sifting sand. Build it on the rock. It's a Jewish idiom in the first century, meaning the Torah. It is the only thing that stands is the Word of God. It never changes. It's the same today, yesterday, and forever. Don't add to it or don't take away from it. Yahweh says, I built the foundation and I built it exactly the way I want it to look like. Do not take away from it. Read Deuteronomy chapter 12 and you'll discover what he says at the end of the book. Don't try to worship me in the ways that, of, 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 the, of the heathens. Don't add to or take away. Worship me in the way that I want you to worship me in. That's what I want. All right, so we see what's happening here. Colossians chapter 2, to sum it up, is all about this. Once again, the traditions and doctrines of men as the teachers, the rabbis, and the sects of the circumcision party and different sects of Ju Judaism, the Gnostics, begin to go out to Paul's converts and try to reconvert them and get a notch on their belt saying that I converted you. Paul doesn't know what he's talking about. And they begin to deceive them, showing them in the law. Knowing that these weak new Gentiles of the faith don't even know the difference between the written Torah and the oral traditions. They don't know any better. That's why they were being deceived, because these religious leaders supposedly are supposed to know the law. They're trying to convert them and using the commandments and the teachings and the doctrines of men. And Paul is constantly trying to get them to say, stay on the, on the course, stay on the rock, ignore what they're saying. Don't let them judge you. So to put it on all perspective, this is what he's really saying. I believe in, Rome, in, in, in Colossians chapter 2, he's saying this, let no one judge you for the way that you are keeping the feast days, the way that you are keeping the Shabbat, because they're not keeping it according to Torah, they're keeping it according to their sect, their denomination. You follow the Bible, and on Judgment Day, you will either stand or not stand, but err on the side of only the Word of God, sola scriptura. Okay? So that's, that's Colossians chapter 2. I hope this may, is making, is this making sense to you? Going through all of these scriptures should help you. We're, one by one, we are unpacking, unraveling. It takes time. We can't do this in 15 minutes. You're talking 2,000 years of us Gentiles trading the scriptures for the traditions and doctrines of men from our ancient Roman forefathers, and we don't even know it. Titus 1.15, read with me on the screen. It says, unto the pure all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and their conscience is defiled. So how many people have said, Jim, if you are pure, everything's pure. And they'll use this scripture. Let's read the context because the context tells us everything. Verse 14 says, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men. Are you getting tired of seeing and hearing? Uh, my voice is getting tired of saying the traditions and doctrines and the commandments of men over and over and over again. Hermeneutical Principle 101 in, New, in the New Testament, in the Brit Hadashah, understand that there's a law of God who's firm and solid and it's stone foundation, and then there is a law of man, which is like bricks. It falls apart and crumbles. If it's like bricks, made out of sand. They try to make it look like stone, but it's not real living stones. It's the tradition and doctrines of men. He says, don't listen to the commandments and traditions of men. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, nothing's pure. They don't think anything's pure. If Yahweh says it's pure, it's pure. Verse 16, he says, they profess they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. In other words, again, it's the same situation. They're trying to bring you the commandments and the traditions of men. Go by the truth only. Go by what Yahweh says, and you can't go wrong. If he says it's pure, it's pure. The flesh versus the spirit. We're going we're gonna to come close to closing here, but I want to go over this because this is amazing scripture in Romans chapter 8 and, verse, and chapter 7. I'm not going to go through Romans chapter 7 completely because you guys all know it. Let me sum it up. The things that I want to do, I don't want to do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. And I don't want to do, and don't want to do, and do. Right? 
We all know that scripture, but let me ask you a question. What does he want to do? What does he want to do that he can't do? And what does he not want to do that he keeps doing? Amazing. Watch this. This is all relevant. It all puts together. It all comes together in the end. Here's what he says. He says in verse 22, For I delight in the law of God. What is the law of God? There's only one law in all of the Bible to these disciples. It's the Torah. I delight in the Torah of Elohim according to the inward man. But I see another Torah, another instruction. See how much deeper it is when we use Bible words? But I see another instruction in my member, another seed, knowledge of good and evil that was planted there 4,000 years earlier. Battle against the Torah of my mind and bringing me into captivity, into bondage to the law of sin, which is in my members. What a wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Thanks to Elohim, to God, through Yeshua the Messiah, our Master, so then with my mind I myself will truly serve the Torah of God, but with my flesh the Torah of sin. So what's going on really in Romans chapter 7? Paul starts off Romans chapter 7 by saying that uh, I'm speaking to those who know the Torah. I read the law and it killed me. And I didn't realize I was breaking the law. Till Yahweh opened up my eyes. And now I realize the very things that I want to do. I want to keep the instructions of God, the commandments of God. But I can't because I have the flesh. Does he say that you shouldn't because you can't? No. It's a goal. We as Christians, we as believers, you know, in our spiritual circle, somehow we've, been, we've grown up with this concept that we're trying to get to a goal, not really realizing that the goal is the journey. Where we go is, 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 is dependent on the journey itself. It's our character. So the Torah is way off in the distance. You're not going to be able to keep the instructions of God perfectly. It's not possible. You are human and you will fall short of His glory. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try. It's like an athlete during the Olympics saying, I know that there are people on this line that are faster than me. I know it. I know that guy. He's broken the world record four times in a row. So I'm not even going to try. Can you imagine an Olympic star who did all this work to get there for four years and decide not to run just because he knows the guy next to him might be faster? Paul says to run the race. For the purpose of winning. It's all about the journey. So now we know that Paul is saying, I want to keep the law of God. Now catch this in chapter 8. Praise God. Chapter, uh, verse 1 says this, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in the Messiah. Meaning that you're going to break God's law. You're going to sin. 1 John 3, 4 says, The definition of sin is breaking the Torah. Sin is the transgression of God's law. And he says, there's no condemnation for those who are in Messiah, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Let me ask you a question. Wouldn't it be awesome to know what the definition of the flesh, walking in the flesh is? And wouldn't it be awesome to know what the definition of walking in the Spirit is? He's going to tell us if we listen. For the Torah of the Spirit of the life in Messiah, for the law of the Spirit of life in, in, in Jesus Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. For the Torah being powerless in that it was weak through the flesh. Meaning it has, it has no power by itself. When you keep it, it, it throws blessing and power through your life. When you break it, according to Mount Sinai, there's a curse. Commit adultery on your spouse, there's a curse. The law itself, don't commit adultery, has no power. It only has power when you break it or keep it. it says we're the ones that were weak. Having sent his own son in the likeness of the flesh of sin... And concerning sin, condemns sin in the flesh. So that the righteousness of the Torah should be completed in us who do not walk according to the flesh. I don't want to walk according to the flesh. What's it mean? Let's keep reading. For those who live according to the flesh, check this out, set their minds on the matters of the flesh. 
but those who live according to the Spirit, the matters of the Spirit. He's building up. Here's the definition. For, my, for the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind of the flesh is hatred towards God, for it does not subject itself to the Torah of God. What? Pastor Jim, are you telling me that the definition of walking in the flesh is not subjecting yourself to the Torah, not following the laws in the Torah? No, he's saying that. That's exactly what he's saying. Read it in whatever version you want to read. It's going to say that the walking in the flesh, the mind of the flesh is enmity towards God for it does not subject, subject itself to the law of God. What is the law of God? The only law that was ever given from God. Whether we like it or not, this is what it's saying. Let's keep reading. It says, and those who are in the flesh are unable to please God. But you are not in the flesh. Indeed, if the Spirit of God dwells in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Messiah, this one is not His. So folks, in ending here, what is happening? We're talking about food. We're talking about whether we can eat clean or unclean. But reality, we're talking about the Torah. We're talking about the instructions that God gave that He said are supposed to be on our heart. We're talking about whether or not we're living in the flesh or living in the Spirit. And in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul, Rev Shaul, Rabbi Shaul, is telling us that to walk according to the flesh is to be against the law of God. Which by default, the flip side of that is to walk in the Spirit is to subject yourself to the law of God. So what we need to discover is whether or not we're walking in the flesh or walking in the Spirit because this thing right here gets me in a lot of trouble because it wants everything. It wants this, it wants that. There's desires that come from that seed that was planted in me when my ancestor, Adam and Eve, ate from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. I now see from that perspective of the enemy, sometimes more than I, I care to admit. But the Father wants me to walk according to the Spirit, man. And the Spirit subjects itself to its inner man and the fence that's supposed to be on my heart to protect me from the flesh. The instructions of God are not given to hurt mankind. They're given to protect. In conclusion, this is what we've discovered. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He created some animals for us to eat and other animals for us not to eat because they are toxic. The Messiah did not come and magically make all toxic animals clean. Can you imagine one day before Yeshua dies, pigs are unclean, and the very next day they're clean? How is this possible? We know that that's not scientifically possible because we know that uh, the unclean animals are still toxic. We know that fish that don't have fins and scales have a higher toxicity than the, the fish that do have fins and scales. So we know for a fact, a scientific fact, that when Jesus died on the cross, He didn't make anything clean. He never created it to be clean to begin with. To make it clean would be to admit He made a mistake in creation. Let that sink in for a moment. If he starts out by saying that these are clean and unclean and ends up by saying they're clean now, those that were unclean, he's saying he made a mistake because the garden was perfect. Eating biblically kosher is not a Jewish thing. It's a Bible thing. It's a God thing. The word kosher has been connected to Judaism for far too long and not connected to the Bible. We need to start eating what the Bible says and doing Bible things in Bible ways. Do we want to be spiritual? Then we need to subject ourselves 
to him and what he says. Don't worry about what your neighbor says. Don't worry about what your, your spouse thinks of you or your children think of you. When we started eating, biblically, the kosher, I got made fun of more than you can possibly imagine. Some of you might have already had that experience. Family members would make us feel guilty, condemn us, make us feel like we're being holier than thou. No, but we are trying to be holy. The only place in the Bible where it says to be holy because I am holy, as we discovered, is found in Leviticus chapter 11, surrounding the context of the food loss. No, I'm not trying to be holier than thou, but I am trying to be holy. I'm commanded to be as such. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to a place where we have got to decide whether we're going to follow man, our denomination, our peers, our pastors, or are we going to follow the king? The king lays down the law, and if you are a subject to the king, we do what the king says. I know this is a difficult topic. I know for some of you, you are shocked. You've never seen the scriptures from this perspective. I encourage you to go back through every single one of these scriptures. Go back through this message again. Don't believe me. Don't believe anything I say. Believe the word of God. It speaks for itself. It took me quite some time to transition from eating unclean to clean because I had... I had patterned myself habitually to eat whatever I want. And I'll never forget, I was on a, on a trip driving down to southern Missouri. I stopped at McDonald's to get a bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich, one of my favorite breakfast sandwiches. I just learned all this information. It took me a couple of years, literally a couple of years of studying before I was totally convinced to see this from this perspective. I took one bite of this bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich, and the Holy Spirit convicted me so heavily, I knew that once I had the knowledge of the truth, I was responsible for it. And I rolled down my window and threw that egg sandwich out and haven't touched unclean animals since. Since then, my body has reacclimated. I, I, I don't even have a taste for it. If I get a salad at a restaurant that has bacon bits somewhere hidden in it, my body will find it because I'll begin to get sick. I can smell it from a mile away. It's disgusting to me now. And I believe it was disgusting to our forefathers, the apostles, and to our Messiah himself, and ultimately to God in the garden. I'm not saying this is an easy path. The Bible says that the road is narrow, and few enter it. If you're struggling with this message right now, it's because of your flesh. That's all. Can you stand with me tonight and let us pray? I know it's a difficult message. I know for some of you, this is the very first time that you've ever heard anything like this. It is a journey. God does have grace. But when we are responsible for the truth is when we hear it. So I encourage you to pray to your king. Ask him to forgive you if you have broken his commandments. Jim, are you saying that it's sin to eat pepperoni pizza. No, I'm not saying that it's sin. He is. And I know that's hard to swallow, but the definition of sin is transgressing the law of God. If he said it, I believe it. I'm doing it. If I break it, it's sin. Can we submit ourselves to him in every area? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for guiding us in your word. Let us not submit to the traditions and doctrines of men, but let us submit only to you. Let us put aside our foolish belief systems that have been built upon the backs of our forefathers through denominational standards, through ecclesiastical structures. Let us open up your word and believe you when you said it, that you meant it, and you meant it for good. We agree that we don't know everything. We don't understand everything. We're still babes in Christ. But Father, we desire 
to go farther, further, faster, deeper into your ways, into your righteousness. Teach us your ways, your decrees. Forgive us for falling short. Thank you for your grace. And Father, I pray that you would give your people the strength, the fortitude, and the desire to put everything aside, to take up their cross, and in love, follow you everywhere you lead us. In the name of the greatest son that have ever lived, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah. Amen.